This is a story about a life, a beautiful life, lived across four countries with multiple languages and loves. It's one of those stories that took a long time to tell. It's funny, at the beginning of the tape, you can hear me say, you know, testing, testing. testing one, two, three, testing. That's author Elizabeth Graver. I'm 58, so when I was 21, I interviewed my maternal grandmother telling stories. And I recorded her, and she told me stories all the time, but there was something about the slight formality of it. What do you want me to say? I mean, she was always a very powerful figure in my life, and always someone who I didn't really understand in terms of her past, except that I knew that it was really layered and rich and hard. Coming to America in 19... We're talking about her new novel, inspired by these home recordings, called Cantica. On this, Desideratum. A desideratum is something you desire as essential. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, celebrating storytelling as essential with my author and narrator friends. Before we dive in, I want to share some exciting news. This episode is being sponsored by Dreamscape Media. Dreamscape is an independent, award-winning audiobook publisher. They produce a wide range of titles from motivational self-help to suspenseful mysteries. I love that their goal is to provide the best, most high-quality audiobooks to listeners everywhere. And I hope you'll connect with them. Visit them at dreamscapepublishing.com where you can sign up for a weekly newsletter that has audiobook deals and updates on their regular audiobook giveaways. You can also connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'll put all their links in the show notes. Okay, back to the story. I knew she spoke many languages. I knew she was Jewish, but she was very different from my Ashkenazi grandmother. I knew she was born in Turkey and then Spain was in there. So there were a whole bunch of questions I had. Um, and she did answer some of those in the interviews, but they're pro- it's probably only an hour worth of recorded tape. I love how you, you described her life as many layers. That's really evident in your storytelling, all these layers. I love how you are weaving um, her experience with, with language and sort of identity with language too. Um, I had not even heard of this particular kind of Spanish. Like Ladino was something, honestly, I, I didn't even know about. A lot of people don't, you know, it's a dying language. It's a, there's been a lot of efforts right now to resurrect it and it's being taught at some places now. And really, partly I think the internet has been really helpful in that way. People know about Yiddish, which is the Jewish language of the Ashkenazi Jews, but so Ladino, and there's even other ones like one called Hecatea, there's Judeo-Arabic. There's a lot of different languages. And then Dialects, but yeah, Ladino um, or Judeo-Spanish, which is the more technical term for it, is the language that when the Sephardic Jews from Spain and Portugal were expelled during the Inquisition, many of them went to the Ottoman Empire and they developed a language called Ladino, which is basically pre-Inquisition Spanish mixed with all these other contact languages. So Hebrew and Arabic and Turkish, Ottoman Turkish and French eventually because that community was educated in French. So it's a really, it's a language itself that has many layers and it's a language that was not written much. So it was in my family anyway, as I understand it, really the language of the home and of mostly women. So there's all these songs and yeah, you call it the kitchen sink, the kitchen sink language. And it was kind of degraded. And yet at the same time, it was the container for all of this folklore and stories and beautiful songs. And so the title is the title of my novel, which I purposefully put in Ladino, partly for that sort of estrangement and curiosity that you're describing. Like, what's this title? Like, 
You might think like cantar or canticle. Yes, there is some hint of song. Yes, but it also just is a, it's a sound. The vast majority of readers will be like, huh? And I love that, that feeling of not being quite able to decipher and needing to explore and go forward is what it's like to be an immigrant, right? To not speak a language. So I love that my editor embraced that title. For supper, there's cold fish with lemon and egg and nokum for dessert. That's narrator Gail Shallon. She was cast and produced by the team at Dreamscape Media. And the ball comes out for catch, the tambourine for song. Later, at home, they will light the braided candle, then snuff it with wine and laugh out loud to show the evil spirits that though Shabbat is over, joy remains and has no place for them. Ha ha ha, ha ha ha. Quien no rizica, no rosica. Whoever doesn't laugh doesn't bloom. Gail says, for her, narrating Cantica was a meaningful act of generational healing and love. I think she did a delightful job and brought a warmth and ease to all the language and beauty in the book. Every few years, they go to Studio Panas at Grand Rue de Pera, where an Armenian man with enormous hands covers himself with a dark cloth and takes their photograph. One year, their nanny, Victoria, who is also their second cousin, is with them and stands behind the children for the portrait. They're in a faux garden with a painted backdrop of a Doric column, silk flowers at their feet. It's supposed to be a choice, garden, palace, salon, or imperial caique, but their father always picks the garden, just as he always positions himself behind the photographer, hands up, a conductor, mandating a pause. Does he have something to prove? Este buena familia. Or something to preserve? He found his second marriage late in life and takes pleasure in his children's youthful beauty, even as he feels time panting down his neck. Or something to hide. He is rarely in the photographs himself. The children's feet ache from all the standing, but even as early as four or five years old, Rebecca notices how being photographed makes her feel more real, more seen. And I think the other thing that is going on with language is this, what you just said about immigrant experience. And uh, at the beginning of the story, they have spent generations in one place. They really have roots in this place. And then there is upheaval in there. They, They shift and they shift again. And so... Homeland and land and rooted down. I feel like there's a theme then with the garden and and planting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Can you talk a little bit about how you did that? Sure. I mean, one of the only things I knew about my great grandfather, whose name was Alberto or Abraham Cohen, I knew about five things about him. One of them was that he loved to garden. And I knew that my maternal grandparents So his daughter loved to garden. My mother is an incredible gardener. My sister and I both garden. And even in my own life, my mother gives us plants. Half my garden is is from her garden. So I feel even before I'd started thinking of the novel that there's this kind of line of plants and things moving. But of course, when you migrate, you can't take much with you. And I was interested in how when everything's reduced everything's just so small. He's lost so much. He's lost his homeland. He's lost his money. He's lost contact with his community and a lot of his relatives. Um, He's stuffed a suitcase filled with bulbs and seeds and he can still do that, but then it doesn't always work. Like some of the seeds or bulbs are dried out or the conditions are different and you can't totally grow the same things, but he keeps trying. And then when Rebecca, his daughter, has to leave him, as things are getting really bad in Europe um, with the Spanish Civil War coming and Hitler rising to power, he gives her seeds, which again, I invented, but, but I do actually have, my grandmother used to put petals in cheesecloth and send them to me, often without even a note. 
So I have flowers that she would send to me. So there's something, there's something about that, about sort of plant life. It's so delicate and at the same time, it's so persistent. Yes. I do think there's an idea of abundance when you have so little, right? What a, what a single seed can give you. Uh huh. The idea of bringing something with you uh, that is a living thing makes you feel connected somehow to the past. That has sort of a universality to it, I think. There's a lot of loss. There's a lot of things that they can't bring. And yet at the same time, there is this sort of endlessness. And it almost reminds me of how I felt writing the novel, which is I had to stop somewhere, but it continues on. Like I could have, I could have gone on and on and on because that's, you know, barring complete catastrophe, what families do in their way, right? Yes. And that is, to me, that that is, it is a, it's a story of Rebecca. For sure, you feel her at the heart of this, but it is also a family saga, a family story. In real life, and, and this really did make its way into the novel, one of the things that was so noteworthy about my own grandmother on whom the character is based is that wherever she went, no matter what the circumstances were, she found beauty in a way that it is really amazing to me. Like she would make things from scraps. She would, she would plant in a corner. She would make friends with an incredible wide range of people. She made friends with a reverend and would go to church with him because she liked the music. And it wasn't that she didn't suffer. And I think she she did and she had anxiety and she had all sorts of things that were hard for her, but that whatever her mix of nurture and nature had given her, I think she was a very loved child. And I think she also, for whatever reason, just had a kind of incredibly creative and somewhat robust temperament. Her little house, wherever she was, was filled with beautiful things, most of which she had made. And and she never stopped. She was always drawing. And and as a writer, that I resonated with that because I also um, just have very strong impulses to to make stuff and to find beauty. And I, maybe I got it from her. One of the things of beauty in this story um, that she cultivates is another character is this stepdaughter. So in in her second arranged marriage, there's a child that is not very verbal, not very mobile, has needs, very special needs. When we first read about this young girl, it's, it's just, it's heartbreaking to see her struggle. So that character whose name is Luna was inspired by my real aunt Luna. And Luna through a birth injury had pretty significant cerebral palsy. Um, So in the novel, Rebecca arrives into this arranged marriage, having been told that there's a child with some health issues, but having no idea how significant they are. And her first reactions are kind of horrible or kind of like, what has happened? What, who is this child? What am I doing here? You know, she's, she does not respond empathetically or even kind of in with an ability to, to see the full person. And that was very uncomfortable to write, but it felt important to me because it felt true to character in that moment. And I'm very interested, even though this has relationship to my real family and not writing kind of idealized versions of people, right? Everybody's really flawed and complicated. And I, it it matters to me in fiction to, to not turn away from that. So in the novel, Luna is being very tenderly cared for and deeply loved by her father and her grandmother. Her mother, of course, has died, her birth mother. Um, But they have no idea how to help her kind of become more independent. And they don't even really understand what her capacities are. They know she's smart, but they don't think that she'll ever be able to get out of diapers or walk because people have kind of said, you know, there's nothing to to be done. So they they put her in pretty dresses and they comb her hair and they love her. And Sam, her father, does read to her and teach her all sorts of things. But in terms of her ability to kind of be in the world, she's not getting anything. Yeah. And Rebecca arrives and she's a total force. And she, interestingly, in in Sephardic culture, and, and my grandmother talked to me about this at least once, 
there's someone in every family in traditional Sephardic culture who's designated a healer. And my grandmother viewed herself as this. And, and she was very bodily and kind of very good at, you know, my mother talks about how I'd be coughing as a baby and she'd pour stuff down my olive oil or something down my throat when my mother's back was turned. You know, she'd be like, she's too young for that. And then I'd stop coughing. Um, so, um, so in the novel, the character Rebecca sees this child, and I think both for reasons of love and empathy and for reasons of self-preservation, where she's just like... Practicality, yes. Mm-hmm. I need this person to be more self-sufficient. She's, she's pregnant suddenly. Her kid, Rebecca, is. Her, she's just got a huge amount to deal with. And she sees this child, and she sees that the child has this spirit and this will and is incredibly stubborn like her. They're actually kind of similar um, and and very bright. And she gets down to work. And so it, it was really interesting to write because it's some of the most tense scenes in the novel where Rebecca, it, it, it's very painful for Luna. She's making her do all these exercises. It's this rigorous, difficult process where they're almost at war with each other. And I guess part of what interested me is that that war is at once physical and sort of emotional because here's this woman who came and suddenly Sam, who was absolutely devoted to his child, is divided. He's got a wife now, right? And then there's another baby coming. And then there are these two stepbrothers, like poor Luna. And it's a blended family. You know, we don't think of blended families so much from the past, but it's a family that's come in with a lot of loss. Like both spouses have lost a spouse Three children who become step siblings have lost a parent. Then there's more kids from the the new marriage, and all of this is totally true to my to my family. This is the you know all these people were real. I I remember getting to that point point in the book and realizing oh there's another layer. Yeah. So there's a lot going on, and I was really interested in Luna both because I was interested. I've actually been interested in writing about disability for a long time, um, maybe because of my aunt, who was a pretty extraordinary person. She was a freelance journalist towards the end of her life. She had a lot of challenges, but she she and I also had a lot in common in certain ways. She read everything I wrote. She also died quite a bit before the book came out. But I drew on some of her writing and, and I thank her in the acknowledgments. And I was interested in thinking about what is it like to be the child of brand new immigrants in the 19, late 1920s, 1930s, 1940s with this disability in a world that, you know, we, we still have a lot of issues around ableism, but it was worse than. So I was interested in her own experience of things and her sexuality and her desires and her longings, but also in how she and Rebecca together kind of had this tug of war, but held each other accountable in certain ways. So Rebecca has many strengths, but if she has some weaknesses, I'd say that she's a little narcissistic. She's very beautiful and she's a dressmaker and she's very good at deploying her body and making surfaces beautiful to get what she needs. And and often that's a survival strategy, right? She needs to do that to earn a living, but she also loves it. She's theatrical. She's, and my grandmother was all these things. She's kind of sexy. She's, you know, she loves clothes. Like she was a performer and we used to both love it and like roll our eyes. (laughs) If there was a piano, there she was. Like she, she liked the gaze on her. And then she, she has this child who really does become her daughter for whom the gaze is mostly people staring at her because she's different from them and they're afraid of her. You know, people are just, they don't know what how to read Luna. And, and so Rebecca keeps saying to Luna, you know, get out there and smile at people and let them see who you are underneath. And, you know, you can be in the quote normal world. And Luna actually sometimes has to say to her, you don't understand what it's like to, to be me. And she'll sort of say, she tells me not to worry about what people think, but she won't leave the house without putting on lipstick and staring at herself in the mirror. So like, who is she? You know, it was really interesting to me to have characters helping other characters both grow. There's a lot of love between them, a lot of persistence and tenderness. And Rebecca has to teach Luna a huge amount. And Luna, even in terms of her, her treatment, has to teach her, like, sing to me, she says, because when you sing, 
then I relax and then I can go down the stairs. That interaction, in some ways, that was the most surprising part of the novel. It, it was the last thing I wrote. It was in a big revision. I was kind of scared of it, I think. And it ended up just, I don't know, it sort of caught me and 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 moved me in a way that I I think that was partly why I was scared of it. But it, it ended up feeling very powerful to write. Yes. You do this thing where you you put the reader in Luna's mind and we have some chapters from her literally from her perspective yes and that that I thought that was that's where it became really evident how complicated those relationships were there were a couple places where you put us in the head of a different character quite a few yeah yeah and always always in those chapters I was like oh oh I hadn't seen it that way yeah I thought that was a great technique as a storyteller to give us their, literally their perspective. One thing you do is there's some, there's some superstitions and it, it sometimes it's in the language, like there's certain little phrases or sayings. And then you mentioned that she's a dressmaker. There's a bead in the dress. And so do you feel those things still, or do you think of those as sort of like old world kind of things? Well, it's interesting because I certainly didn't grow up with blue evil eye beads sewn on the inside of my dress, nothing like that. But I am actually quite superstitious in a a not so healthy way. You know, I knock on wood too much. Um, So where that came from, I don't know. I mean, I'm very different in my upbringing from, from the family in the novel. I was raised very culturally Jewish, but not religiously. I mean, we did major holidays, but I'm not married to a Jewish person. You know, my my relationship to Judaism is cultural and secular and very profound. And and it's a big part of my identity, but I'm not religious. So in, in the novel, Rebecca is religious, but she's also really superstitious. And sometimes the lines blur. And I did do a lot of reading and learning about Sephardic culture that was a quality of what I learned. And it was also interesting because a lot of the superstitions cross between Islam and Judaism. I mean, they weren't religious practices, but they like the evil eye is, it's a thing in Turkey or the Hamsa, right? Yes, yes. And it's shared. I guess I felt in the novel, they have a lot going on. There's a lot of reasons why she would want to clutch a bead that her mother had sewn into her dress after she's had to leave her mother behind to migrate. So in some ways, it's almost like the plants, but in other ways, it does go back to, again, mostly matrilineal set of practices. There were a lot of medicinal practices, some of which were probably real, right? Like there's a lot of herbal cures, some of which like you hang it over your bed, maybe not so much, right? But as a whole, it's sort of a category of both belief and things that have been handed down to you and also something that in terms of character shows them really needing touchstones really needing something to to hold when their lives are so precarious yes yes i think that is what i that is what i really appreciated about it because like you i don't think i've ever had anything sewn into a piece of clothing that i would rub for good luck my kids accuse me of always looking for the silver lining things could be worse uh-huh. someone has it worse right right and i don't want any of the, i don't want to tempt the fates quote unquote and why do we do that why do we even pass that down but that's something ancestral right it's something that sort of is a soup of religion and culture and place it travels with the people generationally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And sometimes I think we don't even know where it came from or what it is. But I mean, you know, people have written in interesting ways about kind of intergenerational trauma, even like what, it, you know, what does it mean for a mother to have a baby in, in the U.S. who grows up, was born there as an American citizen and doesn't have that whole history of migration and then has a child like me who's third generation. and yet it's all in like the soup of how you're cared for and what you're taught and what you believe. And so I I do actually think that even in invisible ways, we're carrying these pasts with us in ways that inflect our behavior and our beliefs and our anxieties, you know, and our robustness, all that. Right. 
which is a reason to tell this type of story because you can see bits of yourself in it or you learn something about someone else. This was clearly a labor of a lot of research. It's more than a fiction. It's anchored in different places and different languages and descriptions of things that take you different places. I appreciated that so much. And I think that's one of the things that makes stories like this so valuable to tell. Um, the other theme that I wrote down, um, but you had three different references to this idea of you have one life to live. Why was that important to touch, keep touching back to with these different characters? The reference I'm remembering is Rebecca talking about it to Luna. And I think in that moment, it's important because Luna's very scared and Rebecca's trying to figure out, should Luna, in this case, it has to do with leave home and go to a school where she can, a school for with disabilities. Yes, I think that was one of them. And she's terrified and feels a bit cast out. And Rebecca is using her own experience of mistakes she's made in the past to kind of say, this is when I acted out of fear. This is when I acted out of a sense of grabbing hold of the life that I have. And I think Rebecca as a character is someone who is very, very aware in some in some pretty sort of profound ways of the fact that things aren't always going the way she wants. But like, this is your life. So like, look around and find connection and find joy. And she's she's lost a lot. So, so she has a pretty strong sense, which for whatever reason, I think I share of life being fragile in certain ways and, and and short, but at the same time being incredibly rich and, and beautiful. And so as a mother, I think her desire is, and, and as a person, it's a cliche, but like see, seize the day, right? Here we are. Let's look around wherever we are. And even if it's not easy to see, even if you can look and see scarcity or lack or what you don't have, and she sees all those things, you can also see oh, here's a rummage sale. There's some velvet curtains. I could turn them into curtains for my scrappy little synagogue show. That's part of her endless life force. Yes, I think even, I I think I also wrote it down when David says it. I think after he has suffered, um, that's late in the book. Right. But he says, you have one life to live. You live it or piss it off, I think. Like he says something more, a little more flippant, but it came up again and I thought, oh, it's really... That's about overcoming things. This is still just your life and you only get this one life. Seize the day is, is, is probably the best way to distill it down. But it comes up several times. I think it's part of this resiliency. Seize and grab hold, right? Seize and grab hold of each other and of life. You know, what I love about that, your reading is that it hadn't occurred to me till you just said that. And this is why I love when really perceptive people read my book and share their perceptions. I hadn't noticed that David mirrored Rebecca in that moment, in that moment when he's on the ship and he has a similar, you're you're absolutely right, but it it was unconscious. So I sort of love that because she's his mother, right? You know, and and we teach them by example. And I I had not picked up on that. So thank you. Yes, he even feels her presence when he's in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a mom, I would like to think my children would feel me if they were in crisis. There was something really beautiful about that, that that he felt her guiding him. I think there are, like you mentioned her being a healer and her physical touch being powerful. I think you do that with a couple characters, this idea of being able to lay hands on someone in, in the most positive and nurturing way. She does it with Luna. She witnesses as a, as a child, she witnesses, witnesses someone else doing it for their mother. That's right. And so this idea of, of nurturing through touch is also, I felt really important to her and to her, to who she was. Yes. Yes. I think that's right. And, 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 and partly in a way, grabbing hold of the world. And when you said connecting to other people, it's actually literally touching other people. In real life, my grandmother was very, very much that way. She would take my hand. My mother does the exact same thing and just turn over my hand and gaze at it and say, so beautiful. In a way that was both very much about me, but also sort of about kind of the miracle of the human body in some way. It wasn't just about me. Yes. 
I wish I could have known her. I feel like I do a little bit through your storytelling. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. And when I was reading just more about you, that, you know, the end of the point, um, even the honey thief has sort of these great mother child bonds. I think as a storyteller, that is one of your strengths is writing about those kinds of physical connections, complicated connections. A lot of mothers and daughters, it's also a mother and a son, but a lot of parent child relationships I work in. And I was writing those long before I had my own kids. It's just always really interested me, the kind of push and pull and the intimacy and the needing to separate. And just, it's, a, it's such an intense relationship. Yes, always. Um, so the last question I usually try to ask, um, and if you have one more, one or two more minutes, sure. the name of the podcast is Desideratum, which is Latin for the desire for essential things. When I was growing up, my parents had a poem they hung on the wall called Desiderata. And uh, it was full of life lessons, things to value, and things that should be important to you. And so I always like to ask storytellers, for you, if you had to explain to somebody, this is essential, this is valuable, what do you say? Oh, wow. And are you talking about Cantica or just... You can answer from the perspective of this particular novel, or you can think of it as just for you... I mean, one thing that I often encourage my students to do is to is to gather stories. And so I have them interview their grandparents. I mean, I think everybody has, everybody has a history. You know, I don't know what made me at 21 interview my grandmother, but I'm so glad I did. And, and people won't be there forever. So I think that sense of kind of, even if someone might not think they have a story or might at first be reluctant to tell it, you have to, of course, be respectful. You don't want to probe if someone doesn't want to talk. But my experience is that most people like to share their past in ways that help you understand who they are when they're sitting in front of you. And so I guess I might encourage people just to sit down with people, particularly older people, seniors, and talk to them. And if they're willing, turn on a recorder so that you can have that voice. And we have a wonderful time. In the meantime, I didn't know how to speak English. So, and I have uh, two sons in Spain. You know, and I guess the other thing would be Rebecca's wisdom of seize hold of your one, you have one life to live and live it fully. Like try not to kind of look forward or back so much as look around in the moment. And I, I, that's a lesson that's hard for me, but um, but to find value in wherever you are, I guess. Yes, I love that. I love that. I think that's so true about um, everyone has a story, but also that there's value, there's value in the storytelling on both ends. There's value in the telling, the process of that, and and being seen and heard that way, but also in the listening in, in what you learn just through the process of listening to people's the stories. The older one was uh, seven years old, and the younger one was five years old, David and Albert. And uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing Elizabeth Graver and her stories as much as I did. You can find the audiobook for Cantica anywhere you listen. It was published by Dreamscape Media, who is also the sponsor for this episode. You can learn more about upcoming Dreamscape projects at dreamscapepublishing.com. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken. Thanks for listening.